morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us at this uh, terrible early time. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our panel on From Law and Books to Law and Practice, GDPR Compliance Challenges for Software Engineers and Micro Enterprises. Uh, a bit of background. The adoption in 2016 and the entry into application last year of the GDPR has triggered, as we've seen, interest from all sides. On one side, industry wants to know how to implement privacy and data protection in software systems and uh, uh, small and medium-sized undertakings would like to know uh, what IT solutions there are to supply their, to support their compliance efforts. And the trouble is there's a huge difference between the law on the books and the requirements of software developers. And so this panel has been organized by three projects which respond to this demand to, 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 to find these solutions. Uh, PDP4E, which is a Horizon 2020 project, which aims to provide software and system engineers with methods and software tools to systematically apply data protection principles in their projects so that their products comply with the GDPR and thus they implement the principle of data protection by design. And I'm pleased to say that this project will promote its results in uh, engineering communities such as IPEM, which uh, Massimo and uh, the EDPS are um, involved in. And then there's PRIS, Privacy by Design Regulation in Software Engineering, a multidisciplinary project which is trying to bridge the gap between the GDPR and uh, software engineering. On the one hand, we lawyers are very happy. The GDPR has lots of many open-ended rules, which means cases, which means we can earn some money. But uh, uh, this is in stark contrast with technical requirements for software, which should be precise for all situations. And then finally, we have Smooth, another 2020 project, which is trying to help micro-enterprises in adopting and complying with the GDPR by designing and implementing easy to use and affordable tools which will generate awareness amongst small and medium-sized undertakings of their obligations and analyze their level of compliance. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the moderator and the panelists. Firstly, there is um, Adina, Dr. Adina Harbinja. Thank you, Adina. She, you've uh, kindly stepped in to replace Pierre de Witt as moderator at short notice. Adina is the senior lecturer in law at Aston Law and Business School in the UK, and her principal area of research is technology law and policy. She explores the application of property, contract law, intellectual property, and privacy online. And I find this very interesting. She is a recognized expert in post-mortem privacy. That is the privacy of the deceased. Now there is an interesting discipline for you. Uh, her research has a policy and multidisciplinary focus and aims to explore different options of regulating online behavior. And it has been cited by legislators, courts, and policymakers in the US, Australia, and Europe. Uh, then our panelists in speaking order are Massimo Attaresi, my former colleague at the, well, he's still at the EDPS, um, uh, and he works partly as a technology security officer and partly as the data protection officer. He advises on technology developments which impact on data protection and fundamental rights uh, as, uh, due to the processing of personal data. And his particular interests are cloud computing, online tracking and profiling, the Internet of Things, privacy and data protection by design and default, and DPIAs. Uh, and uh, he didn't tell me this, but I know that as DPO, he is spearheading the EDPS's advice to the EU institutions on how to be accountable under the EU equivalent of the GDPR, the EU DPR, which came into force last December. Then we have Kim, Dr. Kim Wotes, uh, who is a postdoc researcher at the Department of Computer Science at uh, Leuven University. She has more than 10 years of experience in security and privacy and software engineering. And Kim is one of the main forces behind the development and extension of Lindum, privacy by design framework that provides systematic support to elicit and mitigate privacy threats in software systems. And then last but, but not least, right beside me is uh, Angel, Dr. Angel Cuevas Remin, <coughs> who is an assistant professor in the Department of Telematic Engineering at the Universidad Carlos III at Madrid and the adjunct professor at l'Institut Mines Telecom Sud Paris. Uh, Angel's research 
focuses on internet measurements, web transparency, and privacy. He is co-author of more than 50 papers in prestigious international journals and conferences, and he is currently serving as the technical manager of Smooth, and previously had the same role in the H2020 project types. Uh, before stopping, I should thank two absent friends today. There are two people who are missing, uh, Pierre de Witt and Ivo Emanuelov. They're both from uh, Leuven University. Pierre could not be here today, but he is actually the person who's done all the hard work of organizing this panel, including remote organization the last couple of days, and I really would like to thank him for all his preparation. Ivo should have been here, he was all set, but has gone down with a nasty lurgy, and uh, so we, we wish him well. My name is Chris Doxey, I used to work at the EDPS, and I'm now going to hand over to Adina. Thanks very much, Chris, uh, for the uh, lovely introduction, including my area, which I'm not going to talk about, luckily, for once. Uh, so I'll try to be brief and then pass on to our speakers and uh, leave a lot of time for you to ask questions since you've joined us in this early session after uh, the first exhausting day, I presume. So this panel, is, as Chris um, already introduced some, some, of, some of the topics, is about, obviously, privacy and data protection by design and by default. And we're in particular looking at two communities. The first one is software engineers and how they translate legal uh, obligations imposed by GDPR into technical requirements, and then micro enterprise solutions uh, to support technological solutions that can support their compliance efforts. So you could see what questions we would discuss from, from the panel de description, and I won't be um, repeating them. I will just briefly introduce um, a topics that will be presented by speakers. So first will be Massimo with his uh, presentation on privacy and data protection by design and by default, legal aspects and approach for um, requirements. So this will be a very nice introduction to the two other speakers, giving a broad overview of the notion of privacy by design and data protection by design looking at Articles 24, 25, 32, and 35 of GDPR in particular, and then uh, discussing a little bit it, about um, the um, views expressed and recommendations in EDPS Preliminary Opinion 5, 2018, on privacy by design. Uh, the second um, speaker, Kim, will talk about integrating data protection by design in software engineering, uh, challenges surrounding integration of, of this concept in software architectural design, data protection impact assessments, um, architectural view of the, uh, data protection by design as opposed to the legal view and what we could learn from those and present the interesting findings from the prize project. And then we'll move on from the software uh, engineering uh, community towards micro enterprises. And Angel will present the challenges of data protection by design for micro enterprises, this important part of the, of the EU economy uh, that, um, and their compliance, um, that uh, issues in their compliance that they're facing, obviously due to their capacities, et cetera, that Angel will talk about, and what technology can, can do in order to, to foster and help help their compliance, uh, so Angel will present some insights from, from, from the SMOOTH project. I will, I will now pass on to, to our speakers, and then after their talks, uh, we, we will have plenty of time for discussion, I hope. Thank you. Okay. So here we are. So good morning. Um, I'll go. I'll go directly to the to the topic because things have been widely presented. What I'm here, I'm doing. We are. You know, the panel is from law in books to law in practice. I'm talking about the law in books, and I will make a little bridge, uh, knock on the door of the law in practice, which will be then dealt with by by my colleagues. Uh, so, I'm just saying that in, the, in May 2018, uh, the DPS issued this preliminary opinion on privacy by design. It's quite a wide document in terms of topics, so I'm not talking about that. I just invite you, if you haven't done, to kindly read it. There are a lot of hints and mix, and it, it's useful also to have a survey on the topic. 
But uh, today I'm just taking the legal part out of it and the initial part on privacy engineering. First of all, let me once again repeat the difference between privacy and data protection, if any. Let's see. Uh, so historically, privacy is a term that was born earlier than computers and integrates elements like intimacy of individuals, private life, the right to be let alone, and also, for example, the right to self-determination. And in the new legal framework, it is taken into account by Article 7 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is the, the respect for private and family lives. Whereas data protection was born when calculators came in, because, of course, data in digital form didn't exist beforehand, and then widened the scope, because with data you also deal, deal with all the aspects of your life. So it draws not just privacy in itself, in the original sense, and now in the new legal framework is in Article 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is called the protection of personal data. Nevertheless, in the jargon, well, when we talk here about data protection by design and by default, we, all, we often, I would say, refer to Article 25 of the GDPR. On the other hand, when we talk about privacy by design, we just not talk about the first part. In general, there is a common use, I'm talking about vocabulary here, of encompassing both the original sense of privacy and also the new sense of data protection. <coughs> um, let's talk now about Article 25. I'm not going to repeat the text of the article. I want just to stress four dimensions, which are all mandatory within Article 25, in particular 25.1, which is <coughs> data protection by design. <coughs> the first dimension is the fact that processing personal data has uh, as, as an outcome, is the outcome of a design project. So Article 25 aims at the whole project life cycle, identifying the protection of individuals and the personal data within the project requirements as of the early phases. And that's a, a mandatory in itself. The second dimension is the risk management approach. I will talk about that later on. The fact that measures have to be appropriate and effective. What does it mean? The effectiveness has to be measured against the data protection principles, the overall compliance with the GDPR, and also the protection of the rights of individuals. Easy to say, difficult to quantify. The fourth dimension is also the fact, the specific fact that is the obligation of integrating the safeguards into the processing itself, which is also an indication which is mandatory. Data protection by default, 25.2. That's quite, that's a strange article because people say, what's the difference? I mean, if I do it by design, I do it by default. You are right, absolutely. Nevertheless, it's an absolute article that says that when you do a process, a service, whatever, the default configuration should be the, with the minimal functionality strictly necessary when processing personal data for the basic, for the basic use of the tool or of the service. And I would add, also uh, in line with the reasonable expectations of the user. Uh, let, me, let me tell you that Ennis has just issued a, a report on data protection by, by default and I, invite you, and I invite you to read it. Now let's put Article 25 in context. What's the relationship with the rest of the article? Let's have a look. Article 24, 25, 32, so uh, uh, tasks of the controller, obligation of controllers and accountability of controllers. Data protection by design by default, security measures for personal data, they all of them have an obligation to take appropriate measures. What's the difference? The 24 is the overall overarching obligation for the controllers that targets all kinds of measures, also those that are not embedded in the, soft, in the, in the processing. Records, data protection notices, and so forth and so on. Article 25 focuses on the, on the, uh, the, 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 the measures to put into the processing and makes mandatory the dimensions I've talked about earlier on. Article 32 identifies one of the data protection principles in article, that are in Article 5, that is the security of processing. So it's very specific. Uh, let me see whether I want to tell you something else which is important. No, I go directly to this, which is a bit the core I would want to say, in a starting point also for the engineering part. Despite the GDPR has a lot of you know, there are a lot of, it's, it's, a big, it's a big piece of law. There are places where things are not completely clear, even the DPB sometimes struggles with something. Nevertheless, if there is something which is absolutely coherent within the GDPR, in my opinion, is the risk-based approach. Is everything based on risk management? No. There are mandatory measures, as I said, data breach notifications, I don't know, and what I said before, which are there. Nevertheless, <coughs> both in Article 24, in Article 25, in Article 32, and then more elaborate 
in Article 35, which is the data protection impact assessment, it is clear that we are, we are obliged to have a, uh, a risk assessment of what? What are the assets to protect? Now I'm talking a bit technical language. The assets to protect are the individual's fundamental rights and freedoms. Nothing else, nothing else. And what are the parameters? The nature, the scope, the context, and the purpose of processing. In the article of privacy by design and data on security, you have also to take into account the cost of implementation and the state of the art. But these are limitations. But the target are the individual's fundamental rights and freedom. Now, you might say, OK, the PIA only is mandatory, a risk-based approach. No. If you look at Article 24, the risk-based approach is mandatory as of the outset. What's the difference? That in the DPIA, this assumes a mandatory shape with all the provisions that are in that article when there is high risk for the, for the data subjects. But the risk assessment in itself, the risk management itself, is mandatory everywhere, you know, all times. And what I want to say is that there is no mandatory measures in the law. It's not a prescriptive law, even though under certain circumstances, and as an example, sometimes also as a mandatory measures, you can find the pseudonization and encryption. Now, the question is, OK, but then how can get these requirements out of the law, which is at the end of the day what we want to say today? Let's have a look at what the, goal, what the, what the target of the, of the law, how the, the law is structured. The law is structured like this. You have data protection principles in Article 5. You have direct obligations along the law, but have a look at the obligations. They are not obligations for, to, to identify measures into the processing. They are instrumental obligations which have as ultimate goal the protection of people's fundamental rights and freedoms. So the records, data protection notices, even the data breach notification, which is an ex post, it's a, a reactive measure, a remedial measure, whatever. The DPIA is a methodology. So everything is outside the processing itself. And these are mandatory. And then you have this risk assessment approach towards the fundamental rights and freedoms. So in general, we might say that we can start from the data protection principles and consider them as objectives to target through our measures, let's say, to that we want to identify and set up. But still, we don't have system requirements. Then, that's the bridge that I do towards them. I, I raise the ball and they have to smash. Uh, from there, the idea, the overall, I would say that's very, I would courageous to do like this, but they're doing like this. Uh, I would say that all the privacy engineering efforts that are currently ongoing do like this. They identify systems, the process design goals, design with architecture and functional measures from the data protection principles. Either they keep the principles and they expand it, for example, like security, which is translated into confidentiality, integrity, availability, following the usual security course, or the other data protection principles are considered by intermediate functional goals, which are a bit towards the engineering side, which are actionable, instrumental, that then are meant to cover the principles of the law. That's a bit abstract, but you will see something in concrete when they, they talk about that. So that's the way it works. And then everything is complemented by the risk assessment. The risk assessment is also in the background when you deal with the mandatory measures. That's a sort of mantra that should be, I think, in our minds behind everywhere, everyone. But then what is not covered, which is the unknown by the data protection principles due to the context of the situation, due to the nature of the data that are processed, whatever you want, the technology that is used, then it has to be set up uh, through a risk assessment process. And uh, there are people that have identified building blocks for engineering, they have for engineering for data protection. So they have designed, for example, architectural setup uh, frameworks that are called, uh, they call them, for example, strategies and tactics. And in general, they, they look at the architecture of the information systems, in general, I'm saying, you know, like this. And uh, on patterns, in general, patterns are also a bit architectural, but more defining the functionalities in abstract to solve the recurrent problems. And I, I finished. I'm just uh, with, with, the, with the bridge. Now, this is an added slide, I would say, which is <coughs> someone asked me, OK, tell, me, tell, me, tell us something on GDPR and the responsibility of developers. Let me say very shortly that the GDPR doesn't put obligations on developers. The GDPR puts obligation on controllers and, the, and processors that, in general, are organizations. 
So there is no direct responsibility for IT staff, of course. You might have national law, the labor law, other laws, or also organizational rules that indirectly then, of course, give a certain level of responsibility and liability on the, on, the, on the IT management and so forth and so on. Which doesn't mean that you are not, we, the IT people are not accountable for what we do in data protection. That remains an attitude always. Uh, let me once again stress that Article 25, data protection by design by default applies just to controllers, but there is a recital of the law, which is the 78, that says that producers of product, services, and applications should, because it's a recital, it's not a must, that was kicked off by the legislator at the last minute due to the negotiations from the substantive provisions of the law, so that these people, which are processors and producers of, say, of suppliers of product and products, I would say, because services, they are processors, they, have, they should take into account the obligation of controllers of privacy by, design, a private, a privacy by default. We hope that that could be reintroduced in the privacy direct, uh, regulation, but that would be very, very, very difficult. Okay, I finished. I don't talk so much about what we said in the opinion on the future trends. I mentioned the privacy regulation. That could be enough. If you are curious, please have a read to the preliminary opinion. Thank you very much. Questions in the end. Thanks very much, Massimo, for this uh, lovely introduction to the next more specific talk. So we'll continue with Kim and uh, her presentation on integrating data protection by design in software engineering. Great, thank you. Okay, so I will stand by the mic. Um, I will talk about integrating data protection by design in software engineering. Um, as Massimo, Massimo already introduced, one of the key concepts in data protection by design is risk assessment. And we should aim for an integrated approach from legal and technical perspective. Currently, it's kind of done in isolation. You have DPIA f from the legal perspective and from the more technical perspective, um, we usually do architectural threat modeling, which means that we model the system and systematically analyze threats on an architectural level. Clearly, these are very distinct things. So for DPIA, you need a description of the system, you need to describe the data in the system, processing activities, purposes, and so on. And based on that input, you will identify risks um, assess them and hopefully resolve them. For threat modeling, I just mentioned it, you start from an architectural model of the system, you identify risks, you assess them, and you mitigate them. Now, maybe they are not that different after all. Indeed, they share the same method. But there are some requirements that vary. Basically, the concept, the input, is very different. For DPIA, you will focus on what I call the legal terminology. So you have personal data, processing activities, purpose, lawful ground, controller, processor, which are things that are not in the architectural threat modeling part, where you focus really on the system and, and the interactions there on the processes, responses, data sources. So that's basically the main problem there. We have different approaches towards data. DPIA is purely for personal data, while threat modeling, especially the security part of threat modeling, can be about more general data. For example, we also want to protect corporate data from a technical perspective. Also, the, the actors are different. Threat modeling focuses on interactions with the software system. So, and, and DPIA is more about responsibilities and, and general um, relationships with the data. Um, it is possible in that controllers do not um, actually interact with the system. So for a threat modeling exercise, they would not be included in that, um, in that content. Rationale is also something that we only see at the DPIA side, the purpose um, lawful grounds, those kind of things, that's something that from a technical perspective are currently not taken into consideration. 
And that means that risk is also managed from different angles. DPIA is really about the broad spectrum of protecting the data subject, while for threat modeling it's really about software, about system risk. So what we did is um, we looked at what is currently out there now for modeling these kinds of concepts. Um, and, well, not to be surprised, we did not find anything that supports really a comprehensive description of both these legal and architectural concepts. You can find the details in, in our paper about that. Yet it's really important that um, we align those both modeling paradigms because that, um, that combination would support technical insights in the implementation of GDPR measures. What does that mean? Well, GDPR requires some technical obligations like suitable, uh, suitable security measures or sufficient security measures. Of course, you need some technical insights to assess whether they are achieved. Another thing that um, follows from aligning these two um, paradigms is a simplification of the compliance exercise by uh, matching architectural and legal abstractions. For example, when you are already forced to talk about controllers and processors rather than just from an architectural perspective having external entities, well, you already hint towards that responsibility, that liability that you will need to assess. And clearly also, that would benefit consistency and validity over time if you have this integrated approach, rather than having a DPIA on maybe an outdated model because the architectural model already evolved, that would really um, save some time there. So, because we were convinced that this is really something valuable, we have been working on something toward this, which is our architectural viewpoint for, privacy, uh, for data protection by design. So, for an architectural description, you basically have different architectural views that all represent the same system, but from different angles. You have a client-server view that um, basically focuses on the components of the system and their interactions. You can have a deployment view that focuses more on the relationship between software and hardware. And you have different kind of architectural views, and that's why we also introduce this data protection view. So a model from the data protection perspective. This is the meta model for the view. So this basically describes the concepts that are under the hood. And these concepts are based on what I have been talking about before. So you have all the, the legal concepts in there and their relationships. <coughs> and this uh, is based on the GDPR clearly, and we also looked at the Article 29 Working Party recommendations on um, DPIA documentation requirements. And this would result in this kind of model. Oh, there, something went wrong here. Um, <laughs> it's encrypted. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but, so, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happens there. Um, but, so basically all of those concepts are actually instantiated with proper values, which you not, cannot really see now, but um, this is an example of a patient monitoring system, meaning that a patient wearing a sensor, um, which collects all kind of activity data, which is then sent to some backend where it's processed for cardiovascular diseases, so you have the, the patient monitoring company that is the controller, a general practitioner that is the recipient of the data and all sorts of processing activities and datas, uh, data sets. So you have a different representation basically of um, your DPIA documentation, which is currently, I guess, mostly a table that you fill in. But of course, it's more than just a representation it is actually integrated in that architectural framework, meaning that you can really connect it with the other architectural views, for which we have identified some correspondence rules. 
it's kind of complex. I will not go into detail, but th the idea is that it's not something that is, can be done fully automated because there, well, there are some differences between the architectural and, and uh, the data protection views that I mentioned before. So some things will have to be done manually, but you can create, yeah, some, some things also went wrong there, but um, <laughs> you can basically, um, when you have the input of the view I showed before, and this is a data flow diagram, which is typically used for threat modeling. If you combine the two, then you have this kind of correspondence model where you see um, both views. And why is that good? Well, this provides integrated DPIA support, meaning that you have support, possibly some tool support, automation, for a number of completeness and soundness checks. Um, one of the things you can do is check whether the, the entire chain of processing activities always starts with a collection activity, which is something that is obligated by law. Um, I, I refer you to our paper for more um, examples. Also, legal requirements can be checked more in an automated way. You have purpose limitation. Clearly, you are forced to um, model the purpose, but you can, again, um, trace that through the entire chain to see whether for each processing activity the purpose um, still holds. <coughs> and by having this integration, clearly the risk management will be integrated as well. Um, other advantages are the architectural level change impact analysis, meaning that when you change something in one view, that change is also shown or um, highlighted in the different views. So, for example, if in the architectural view you introduce a, no, a new process, um, that is also shown or maybe even trigger a check in the data protection view to see whether that new process is still consistent with the original purposes or whether something new should be um, created. And of course, also architectural trade-off analysis becomes easier because making an architectural decision can also impact, uh, can also have legal consequences when you um, decide to host some consumer data um, at a cloud provider. That's great for availability and performance, but that will also have legal implications. So, will this solve all problems and can we fully automate DPIAs, well, no, but we believe that this really is a stepping stone towards um, a risk-based approach that at least does not exclusively focus on that legal notion of risk. So if you want to know more, we have um, two upcoming papers about what I presented here. Thank you. Okay, that was even better timekeeping. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, we have some time left, which means we have more time for you to ask questions later. But before then, we will uh, hear what Angel has to say in his talk on uh, microenterprises, so the second community that we're focusing on in this panel and challenges of data protection by design technology uh, in relation to compliance in this sector. I'll make it So, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here so so early. And uh, I'm gonna address a different uh, angles and basically refers to the challenges that micro enterprises are facing in the in the digital era. And and if we are seeing here so many com so complex concepts, let me let us think on on, on, a, on a micro enterprise, which is a company that. Uh, the, the definition is with 10 employers or less, including self-employed people. I'm pretty sure you have brother, cousins, friends that, they run, that are running their own businesses and they are very busy in their businesses. So if you start talking to them about this kind of, of, of concept, probably their, their, their head will blow up. A uh, couple of examples. A few months ago, I went to a, a physiotherapist clinic and they asked me a bunch of questions regarding what, what pains I had in the past, whether my back was okay or not, plus some, 
personal data uh, for contacting me, mobile phone, email address, uh, postal address, etc., etc. So they create a profile of me. Obviously, I didn't sign any paper. I didn't give them any consent. And after some time, I start receiving also uh, advertising through my email about offers uh, of this of this clinic. Similarly, I went. I wanted to buy an apartment last year in Madrid. I went to a real estate agency, and again, they start asking me a lot of things about my salary. Uh, they ask me papers about my my tax declaration, etc. They justify this for creating a profile and offering me the the, the, the apartments that were more uh, appropriate for for my profile. And again, I keep receiving uh, advertising through my email for for still now I'm receiving. I didn't give any consent to these companies, and probably it's not because they want to treat wrongly my data, but it's because they don't know what they have to do with that and how they need to to protect to protect uh, the personal data of, of their customer. They are in other in other in other businesses, and I'm pretty sure any one of you can think of similar example that has has happened to you in your in your daily life. If we think about compliance. If you go to Google, I did take two minutes to, to get this, this, this news. We can find this kind of, 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 of analysis, like Cap Germany saying 85% of the companies are not ready for the GDPR. This is not referring to micro enterprises, this is referring to all types of enterprises, including large scale companies. So if, if large scale companies are having problems, are struggling to adapt to the GDPR, what's, what's happened with the, with the micro enterprises? We can really demand them to understand all these concepts that have been introduced before, privacy impact assessment, data processor, data, uh, data controlling, and so on. No way it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen that. Uh, but they are really an important sector. If you think of what microenterprises represent for Europe, if you think of SMEs, this, this is a report from the European Union, if you think of SMEs, they generate nine out of 10 employees in the European Union and more than half of the added value in the European Union. But if we think only microenterprises, the, the orange circle on the left bottom side, they are employing 30% of the, of the people in Europe. If we add small businesses with less than 50 employees, they are employing half of the population. So probably these companies are really managing a bunch of personal data from our, from our own. And right now, they are out of the game of data protection. So we need to do something to bring them in. And we need to understand that between this being 0% compliant and being 100% compliant, there is things in between. So better to bring them to be 50%, 60%, 70% 70 compliant than nothing. So what we are doing in the, in the Smooth Project, or what we have done in the, in the past, we have one partner, which is the European Small Business Association. So we told them, OK, can you do a consultation with your your, your members, which are other consumer associations, uh, sorry, small business association from other European countries and beyond, and tell us what are the main challenges these companies are facing. And they, they came up with five main elements. First, awareness. When we talk about microenterprises, we need to assume zero knowledge about data protection. So we cannot assume they, they know what a data processor is, we cannot assume what a data controller is, and we need to start creating awareness, there is a big gap still, and we need to create awareness in these companies that they have an obligation of protect the personal data of their customer. Second, second element, time constraint. They cannot dedicate hours and hours and hours to understand what the GDPR. They have enough with running their business, getting their money to, to, to pay their child, children's school, to pay their mortgage or whatever. So they, they, they don't have time for this. Obviously the cost how much it costs for them to somehow be compliant with the GDPR. They cannot spend thousands and thousands of euros on another process for, for understanding whether they are compliant or not. Simplicity, when we approach to, when we approach to them, we need to eliminate any kind of technical, technical concept. We cannot talk again about data processors, data, data controllers. We need to go and approach them in a very simple manner to, help, to bring them into the data protection and let them understand that this is not, is not only an obligation, but it's something for good because if they protect their customer data, they will, create, they will increase the trust in the relationship. And finally, trust. Any solution that they will adopt to, uh, uh, to approach the GDPR and try to be compliant needs to be something that they, they trust. 
We also did a, a survey across, across uh, uh, micro-enterprises, but I need to highlight that these are quite special micro-enterprises. These are not the traditional micro-enterprises like the physiotherapist clinic or the real estate agency I was talking before. These are mostly digital micro-enterprises, startups and so on, with, let's say, in terms of, of knowledge of regulation and so on, they, 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 they represent a elite of, of, of micro-enterprises. So the good news is that at least these micro-enterprises are quite aware of that the GDPR is there. They are quite aware of what are the fines they might be facing in case they, they are not compliant. But when we go into the details and we start asking uh, elements that should be covered by these companies, like uh, uh, first only one of them say, OK, we think we are fully compliant. The rest of them, they think they are not compliant with the, with the GDPR. When we are asked, start asking them if they are using informing consent, 80% say yes, 29% no, and half of them say simply, we don't know if we are using informed consent or not with our customer. In terms of security, only 35% of them apply some uh, basic measures. Therefore, for storage, we even find some of them that use USB sticks to store the personal data of their customers. And in terms of online presence, many micro-enterprises nowadays have websites, even some of them have mobile apps. So only half of them has cookie policies. And again, think we are talking about an elite of micro-enterprises. They are not really the traditional micro-enterprises that probably represent the, most, uh, the, the larger number of micro-enterprises. And we ask them, OK, what do you want? How, how we can help you to do that? 60, most of them say that they prefer actually a low-cost online solution than a approach a, or short contract a law firm or consultancy services. Why? Because they, when they, you talk to them about law firm, law firm or consultancy service, they think this is going to be too, 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 too expensive for them. Half of them say, OK, the time constraint. How, much, how long do you want to dedicate, in, even if you use an a online solution to uh, to this thing of data protection. They say they don't want to spend more than 30 minutes doing whatever in that platform to, uh, that is supposed to help them with data protection. What about the cost? Most of them, almost two thirds of them, they would like to, to pay more than 50 euros for a solution that help them to be compliant with the uh, data protection. Therefore, this is a signal that they really don't understand how painful it could be for them in case they have a data protection case or investigation open by, by, by a DPA. And something that all of them are demanding, or most of them are demanding, are, OK, we need help. We need samples of documents, samples of informed consent, samples of privacy policies, samples of cookie policies that can help us to approach the GDPR and try to be compliant. So what, what does Smooth is doing? Uh, uh, Smooth is, aims to create a, a, a cloud service, a cloud platform that help these guys to at least approach to the GDPR and create a sort, sort of compliance report that warns them of what are the main elements of the GDPR that affect them that are not well covered by the current processes. So the first thing I have to say is Smooth does not aim to cover the full GDPR. In our opinion, it doesn't make sense in the, in the particular case of micro-enterprises of trying to be uh, too demanding. So as I said before, between 0 and 100, if we are able to reach 60, 70, we will be very happy and the project will be a success. So uh, we are working in two different axes. In a smooth, one of the axes has to do with the awareness. So we are aiming to create something we call handbook that will be implemented in, the, in two format, website and mobile app. We want to dedicate a specific handbook for micro-enterprises. First of all, let, letting them know what are the main elements they need to cover in, the, in their daily business. So which are the basic, basic aspects of the GDPR that affect for them. I do not have time now because I'm, and I'm not a legal person, but some of my colleagues, some of them are here today in the audience, did a great job identifying what elements of the GDPR are the most important for, for, uh, for the micro-enterprises. I invite you to go to the, to the Smooth website. You can type H2020 Smooth. 
and there is a public deliverable, which is called deliverable 2.1, about requirements, and there you will find very nice tables that identify those as aspects of the GDPR. So we have, what we want is with this MOOC, with this handbook, is to try to approach the GDPR in a fancy and simple manner to microenterprises. And there we'll provide them examples of simple, of informed consent, uh, privacy uh, policies, cookie policies, and all type of these legal documents. Later from the technical, more technical point of view, we are gonna create a platform that automatically uh, analyze the compliance of, of, of these companies. And we work in four different blocks. First, we have a, something called an entry questionnaire. So when they register in the platform, we'll make some question to them about their, uh, whether they are uh, managing personal data, we'll provide a list of items of personal data so they can mark them. They might not know that they are basically managing personal data. And later we'll work in three axes. One that will analyze automatically informed consent, privacy policies using natural language processing techniques in case they have them because we are expecting in many cases they, don't, they probably won't have anything. Later, having nice, uh, the, what we'll analyze here is if all the basic elements of the GDPR are there, the right to access, the right to, to delete your data, if they are in form of potential third parties in your website processing, I mean, that might be collecting personal data. The second element, uh, the second block will be analyzing their databases, try to find in those databases what are the actual personal data <coughs> they are storing and they are processing by using pattern, uh, pattern recognition techniques. And the, the following element uh, will be analyzing their websites and mobile app to see if even they don't know, but by injecting a Twitter button, a Facebook button, they might be providing your personal data to third parties. And there is a bunch of third parties present in, in, in websites. So we will analyze automatically whether, present, whether there are third parties present in their websites. And at the end, with all this information together, we have a compliance report model that using uh, machine learning techniques, we'll analyze all together and we'll come up with a compliance report in which we'll tell them, okay, it's okay, your informed consent is fine and you are telling you are, I don't know, storing the mobile phone and processing the mo mobile phone of your customer, but you, in addition, are storing their mail, their postal address, their email address, and you are not obtaining consent for this, so please, you need to solve this. And things like this that they can easily understand and we'll provide also guidelines on how to, how to, solve, how to solve them. So, if you want to know more about the project, we can discuss afterwards. Uh, and with this, I conclude my, my, my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, again, lovely. I have never been to a panel when everyone <laughs> sticks to the time, which is uh, really refreshing. So, um, I will use my, uh, well, first, thank, thanks to all the speakers for their uh, great contributions to this important topic and developing topic. As, as we all know, I will use my moderator's privilege to um, ask a question and, f and perhaps first to announce something that I think uh, connects to my question really well. So uh, Natalia Bielov has noticed on Twitter that there is no e-privacy uh, panel as such at the conference. So she's inviting everyone to join a chat on e-privacy tomorrow morning at 9 in Area 42 mm -hmm. here. So if you wish to discuss e-privacy in more detail, uh, please come along. I, I definitely will. So that. Um, that my question is related actually to e-privacy, and Massimo has already mentioned it briefly, so it might be a bit too broad, or, or the answers could be long, <laughs> perhaps, but I would like to ask um, what the speakers, all of them, think from their different perspectives on uh, embedding the uh, privacy by design as suggested by ADPS, and this risk management approach in e-privacy, and how they see this playing out. Uh, if they can have some predictions and thoughts on, on, on this important topic, given the importance of the industry that e-privacy uh, regulation will cover. Okay. Okay. Well, well uh, it's quite a complex question, I would say, so replying immediately is not that easy. At the same time, I want to repeat what I said before. We had, at the beginning, of the, in the proposal of the of the GDPR, the obligations for, for producers and uh, of products and services, uh, I would say, even though the services at the end of the day, they are taken into account by the processors, but as you know, privacy by design doesn't 
apply to processors, apply just to controllers. So this obligation was in at a certain, certain point in the text. But then, uh, of course, it was a bit considered too, too heavy by the co-legislators, and then it's not any longer in the text. So I would, uh, I would, I wish it could go back, at least in the privacy directive, consider the fact that uh, electronic communications have uh, an essential role in society, furthermore because of the current, uh, you know, uh, implications of the use of digital uh, services in for democracy, for example, uh, surveillance by states and by other uh, economic entities. So I think that that should be that should be something which is. And by the way, putting that into the into the privacy could also retrofit, uh, retro boost also the rest of the the economy, uh, even for the wider the wider uh, you know. GDPR, I would say, the processing of personal data, because you know, e privacy, e privacy is a is a regulation that is the only one that mm, at the European level that is on, on on the Article Seven of the Charter, so on the protection of, of the intimate life, privacy, and, and life and family life and communications. So it's an important piece of legislation which is unique, I would say. Um, so that's a bit the idea. Lovely. Thanks very much. Does anyone else want to yeah. uh, jump in? Um, as a non-lawyer. Um, I, I, I think my, my main um, conclusion from my, uh, my talk still stands that I, well, I think for, for computer scientists the, the biggest challenge will just be to, to bridge the gap between legal and, 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 and technical requirements and obligations and we would be happy to see what the, the legal um, regulations and directives will be but I think the first thing is to m mainly bridge it on conceptual level, and then we'll see how the, the implementation will actually be. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. So, uh, <coughs> just, uh, just, uh, just to add something, I mean, from, from, from the context I'm here, from my enterprises, as I said, this to me is a long journey, so we should be, we shouldn't be thinking right now about privacy by design for, for my enterprises, like, that's like pretending that a five year all child gets advanced algebra courses. So if we think more about large companies, what I think is here still we are in, in front of a, a, an important trade-off, which they still see privacy data protection, implementing privacy by design as a cost, but they don't see the benefit uh, behind them. So somehow we need to work into educating people to somehow force them to force companies to understand that, that uh, privacy by design is not only a cost, but in the, in the medium term at least will be a benefit for, for them because people will trust their services and unless they, they have this, this mechanism in place, probably they will leave at some point the, the services not taking seriously the privacy by design principles. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we'll now start taking questions from the floor, so please to ask questions to any of the speakers. Yes, please. Do we need a microphone? We oh, or if you could please, because uh, the session is no, the mic recorded. Yes, I'm Victoria from SECE. I do compliance for SMEs in Spain and in Colombia. And I agree with Angel. Um, there is no knowledge and no desire for compliance from the small companies. I just wanted to add that the Spanish Data Protection Agency has come up with a very fascinating tool called Facilita, which really provides micro enterprises with, you know, the basic stuff. Um, but there are many micro enterprises doing big data, and I don't think that's enough. So I think there should be more companies like like yours or like mine. We're also working on a tool, uh, providing um, training and and. Uh, and compliance. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to, to, to add something, we, the, the Spanish Data Protection Alliance is part of our consortium, so we have them on board, and we know pretty well the Facilita tool, and actually, I was mentioning before that we are designing an entry questionnaire, and this entry questionnaire somehow is, 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 feed, is being fed by, by the Facilita, by the Facilita tool. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's something to start with, but still the Facilita tool is not, I mean, is not enough. I mean, the facilitator at the end is very useful for a small business to 
to validate they are doing the right the right thing. But if they are not doing the right thing, they don't get the the support or they don't, they don't get enough guidance to know what they are doing. And this, I, I'm saying, facilitate is great, but we want to build something, something add something else. else on top on top. Because of that. it's enough, even though it's free. I think yeah. companies don't really take the time to investigate and see how they can benefit from it. Yeah. Unfortunately. <coughs> Another question there. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Lee from Microsoft. Uh, it, and in this uh, discussion of micro enterprise, always uh, fascinating to me personally. I, I, because I think in, in, in the case, as uh, Massimo talked about, is about risk, man, risk man assessment, right? Uh, a small enterprise creating educational apps for school, school children impose a whole lot of risk as compared to even a big olive farm, all right? If you're only growing olive, who cares, <laughs> right? I mean, it comes down to risk assessment, and if you have high risk, absolutely, that ought, you have a responsibility to your customers and to your shareholders and what have you to do the right thing. And that should be the, the way to make the assessment instead of just keep thinking about micro enterprise versus because you know, in the digital world, size of the company hardly matters anymore. You should, we should not use that as a, a scaling factor. It is instead about what you do and what kind of things you do, what kind of processing that you do. I think that's far more critical as an uh, 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 assessment tool. Uh, so another thing to think about is that, uh, yes, a lot, it's, a, it's a heavy lift for a lot of, lot of small en entities. And, but perhaps a better way to think about it is a continuous improvement cycle, right? As stipulated by ISO 27001, for example, right? In security management system. Is that you don't profess to have it perfect right from the get-go, and there's no such thing as being perfect, but you assess the risk and you address what you can address based on the risk. Right, so I think that might be a way to think about it instead of uh, just using size and just you know uh, try to get them some min bar somewhere. Uh, just some thought to enough for the panel. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I agree with what you are saying. So many of the micro enterprises, and we have a special aspect of the project that is looking into microenterprises dealing with sensitive of special data category data. So we have, there are plenty of, of, of uh, I don't know, psychologists or uh, medical clinics and so on that lies in the category of, 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 of microenterprises <coughs> and still they, and they are managing very sensitive, sensitive data. I have a, a friend which is psychologist and I have told to him many times because that data in case it's leaked and so on could be could create real serious problems to, to their patients. And, and obviously, you can think that many psychologists are not adopting the proper security measures and so on. But again, uh, obviously, they are liable because the, 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 law, the law and the regulations say that. But they are not aware about, about this. So the point we want to raise here is that obviously, the, the risk is not, is, is not fully correlated, there is some correlation with the size of the companies. But if they are not aware, well, a large company probably has lawyers or has a legal department that make the company <coughs> aware, but if they are not aware, doesn't matter if they are liable or not. So we need to make them aware, yes or not, yes or yes, and, they aware, and, they sub, and our project has found that this is still a huge gap between these small businesses and uh, the they get into some knowledge of the GDPR. They don't even know it exists. So that's, that's, I think, is something we all need to work. We have a new project, but I think this goes beyond our project and the DPAs, the European Commission, and so on, need to put money basically in place and resources to, to try to close this <coughs> gap as much as possible and as fast as possible. Yeah, I think also one of the, the hurdles there is that, um, especially in the continuous assessment and continuous development, when you have 
uh, agile development, the goal is to have fast updates and when for each update you have to go through some time consuming compliance exercise that you probably have to outsource as a micro enterprise because you don't have the legal expertise in house, then, then there is still a problem on, on how to do that practically. So I, I think there are some challenges there still, still left. Another way to, to go for is mm -hmm. going through the category associations. I think that's very important, you know, for sectorial, uh, uh, you know, to take the, inter the migrant enterprises together. Because that's a strength that can be used in order to gather funds at national European level, or, for example, to use uh, certain uh, deliverables that uh, um, association of categories um, <coughs> produ uh, produce at national European level, for example, codes of conduct, Sometimes they have deliverables. You know, that's the, the, there is a, a resource that is when it, when you are together with the others, there is a resource that can be can afford can be afforded. Uh, and then and then that's a, a common a common tool for this kind of for the same kind of enterprise. So that's a bit of a, tr a thread that could be used in order to you know go on on the and overcome the, the, the small sides. I would say among others. Do we have any other questions? Yes, we do. Uh, yes, two, uh, sorry, my name's Guy. I work for a company called Privatar. Um, uh, I had a couple of questions. So one, um, Massimo, I enjoyed the comments you made. Um, one seemed particularly relevant to some stuff we do, which is uh, around copying CIA triad, triad for uh, privacy engineering. And so we see sort of two um, directions that's gone in. ANISA and NIST's equivalents, and NIST's predictability, manageability, and disassociability we see it's yeah. becoming a bit more yeah. dominant yeah. in between. I'd be interested in knowing what your thoughts are on, on those three, and if that is the sort of thing you mean as an intermediary and how you would see that mapping to privacy by design. And I totally agree in terms of designing systems, having things you can test um, in terms of those three uh, uh, objectives is very useful, um, as opposed to more uh, uh, hard to define principles. Um, the second thing is I work on the IEEE Data Privacy Process Standard, which is uh, P7002, which is being developed at the moment. Um, and in that, that's looking at a couple of things. One, system design, but also software design uh, with respect to privacy. Uh, and obviously, that's meant to be an international standard. Um, and so there are steps where you take into account the legal framework within which you're operating. Now, if you're designing a system for use in a company that has... Um, certain clear constraints, you know where you're operating, right? But if you're designing software where you don't know where it is, um, considerations of which legal regime you should be taking into account at that step in the process becomes harder. Um, and whilst one could say, well, you should be designing for any um, country where it may be sold uh, or making it modularizable or some, some other aspect like that, that can be quite challenging for a lot of software developers. So again, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on that as well. Not the only thing I can say, uh, you're right, absolutely, I fully agree all the analyses you have made. Even though uh, the legal regimes are very are, di are different, but at the end of the day, I see that we have also had a workshop on, in November uh, where we, are, you, we have the NIST framework. And the NIST framework, of course, is based on a bit on what, it's not something which is based on legal obligations. Uh, even though they understand the social uh, impact of that of privacy, and also there are obligations that are more sectorial in the United States but with respect to you know our overarching uh, general protection law as we are. Nevertheless, we see that at the end of the day, the majority of the, the practical problems to be solved are roughly the same. So I have the impression that despite the there are differences in the legal frameworks, I don't know. I have the impression that through a certain level of configuration and, uh, and modularization, as you are saying, you would encompass at least the 80% of all the direction laws in the world, at least US, uh, uh, European Union, uh, Japan, which is now is adequacy, is ad adequate according to the, you know, to the commission and decision. So uh, El Brazil, which is, you know, it's not that far from, from the EU framework. So I would say that I'm not that pessimistic on that then maybe you are more expert than I am. So I, that's why I, I give you just my, you know, my feeling. But I'm not in the industry, so I don't realize how it could be. My, my feeling is that with a little modularity and configuration, you can cover a lot around the world, I would say. But that's, that's my perception, yeah. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. We have more questions. Yes, please. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I, you have mentioned DPIA several times, and I mean there are quite many guidelines on DPIA from different DPAs. There are also consulting companies who do that, and so on. Yeah. And one of the approaches to do the DPIA is to basically uh, boil down the risks to some quantified number, like choose a threshold and then decide, okay, where is my threshold, so where are my risks, yeah, and then uh, from your own practice, because you have seen many companies, can you recommend some, some of the uh, approaches to do this quanti uh, uh, quantifying of the risk which uh, from your point of view work really in the practice? Um, well, that's that's one of the, the big challenges that we're also working on. Um, so we're from universities, so it's it's the research angle we are looking at. Um, but we are indeed looking at um, sort of defining ranges for risks um, that you can introduce in your tool and, and, and that you can sort of play with to see what comes out. But having real... Um, good metrics for that, or, or, or the, that's a challenge. Um, um, if I'm not mistaken, because it's work of my colleague, we are mainly focusing on the FAIR um, risk assessment. Um, so I, well, we can talk offline, but that's something I would, would, um, would advise. But it's, I don't think it's uh, something that is fixed we are looking at it currently mainly from the architectural perspective and I can only imagine how that would be from the legal perspective to really put numbers on that. I, I doubt that lawyers will be happy to say, well, now this is 0.5. <laughs> yeah. The only, uh, as you know, a lot of, there is a lot of people that use the CNIL methodology, for example. Uh, and then you have a lot from ENISA. So you have, you know, ENISA works a lot, and not only for the, the assessment of the risks for data protection, both an ex ante for DPIA and ex post for data breaches, assessment on severity and so forth of impact. So that's a good uh, source of guidance. And of course, as you have it also in security, even more in data protection and privacy, which is a bit more contextual uh, uh, topic, I would say, than security. So where the factors or risks uh, are many and not under control from you. So in general, if you assess, it means that you, have, you are in control of what you assess, which is not simple. It's not simple to, to I mean, I have an idea, you know, the rule of the thumb, but knowing know every single data subject I'm, whose data I'm processing, that's very difficult. So it is, in any case, a subjective assessment, but there are certain frameworks that are shared, there are experiences that are shared. Uh, I think the more we go on, the more we could find uh, this, you know, this framework that has started to be used in their maturity. So also this kind of, you know, um, taxonomy, I would say, of impacts and situations uh, will be more stable and shared. I don't know whether I gave you an idea. Okay, we can take one more question before I pass on to Chris to close the panel. Do we have uh, anyone else in the audience who would like to follow up? Uh, if not, then we can start closing. I would like to thank again to the speakers and the chair before he closes and Pierre and Setip who organized this panel and got us all together. So thank you. And Chris, please do. Well, Padina, you thank the panelists, so I'd like to thank you. <laughs> and again, thank Pierre and uh, uh, send him our best. Um, I must say, I think a, a panel like this ought to be a compulsory education for lawyers to, to actually, you know, show us the real world, you know, who knows what these basic principles are, not much. Uh, how do you reconcile the legal principles with the demands of software engineering? Not easy. Uh, uh, and um, what is important about the GDPR? I'm really going to look up your, uh, <laughs> your website and see what you've located as the important um, uh, element. So I, I really, I personally really enjoyed this panel and I've, I've got a lot out of it. I think lawyers really need a wake-up call like this as well. Um, 
In terms of information that's available, you've heard about the studies. I'd just like to tell you about a, um, a freebie that's available. The uh, Oxford University Press are producing a commentary on the GDPR this summer. But we've put out, uh, I'm one of the editors with Chris Cooner and Lee Bygrave, and we've put out 16 of the commentaries uh, on the internet. And I just did a check. If you go into your privacy friendly search engine and type in Cooner 2018 draft commentaries GDPR, I mention it because we've got Article 24 and Article 25 accountability and privacy by design are there on the internet for you to read already. So thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers, PDP4E, Prize and Smooth for organizing this. And thank you very much for coming and have a nice day.